Good morning and shalom, everyone. Welcome to Acts Reformed Church. Uh, I was actually not able to do the Sunday school for the last couple of weeks because I had, well, I wasn't feeling well one week and the next week I had to work. And so uh, I would like to thank Brother James for filling in for me those two weeks. He had a two-parter, <laughs> so that's good. So it worked out by the providence of God. So uh, we, we want to welcome you to Acts Reformed Church. Our, our Sunday school begins at 9.45 a.m., and I live stream that on the Theology Zone Facebook page. This is where we're live streaming right now. And then later I will upload it to the Theology Zone YouTube channel. And on there I have uh, several Bible studies and uh, several Sunday schools that I have taught here at the church. And uh, <clears throat> right now we are in a series on the subject of the attributes of God. And uh, we are going to start our corporate worship at 10.30 a.m. That will be live streamed on the Acts Reformed Church Facebook page, later to be up, up, um, uploaded to the Acts Reformed Church YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching this online, we welcome you to join us here at 3528 East Temple Way, West Covina, California. And in here, you can come and visit us if you're interested in looking for a church and we happen to be in your area, we would like to meet you. And uh, at this church, of course, we're Reformed Baptist, we're Evangelical, uh, and we, we are very re reformational. We believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone, and to God alone be the glory. Amen, Amen to that. So every Sunday I have a tradition where we recite the Jewish prayer, the great Shema of Israel. And it is, it's written on the screen right here, so if we can cite it together. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Which in Hebrew means, hear O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. And so what we are saying is that we are not committed to any other God but to the one God, Yahweh. Of course, yes, there are other gods, but they're not the almighty God. They're not the creator God. They're not the sovereign God. The, the, everything that we've been covering in the attributes of God, there's not, no other God that fits that description. But there are so-called gods, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that he, he says that there are those that are called gods, and he, uh, verse 5, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 8, 5, he says that, that in heaven and earth, whether there be, there be gods many or lords many so-called, but for us, there is one God, the Father, and our one Lord, Jesus Christ, which is the Shema, the Father and the Son, and by default, the Holy Spirit. The last time uh, I was doing a part one to the subject, God is omniscient. Now, what I was trying to do is basically give a br basic overview of what God's omniscience is. It means that God, omni, means all, and omniscient refers to God's knowledge. So, so the knowledge of God is is all-encompassing, the, the scientist, I guess the shint. So the omni means all, and the shint means knowledge. So God has all knowledge. However, <clears throat> what I wanted to cover today in part two is on a very introductory level, because I am not going to resolve this issue. There, there's a lot of uh, theologians that are far more intelligent than myself, that, and I'm not a professional theologian, uh, that can cover this with far greater de but depth, but uh, in a Sunday school class where we have a limited amount of time and we got to cover other things as we go along in the following weeks, I'm going to try to do this on a very general introductory level. Today I'm going to cover the subject of open theism. So the question is, what about open theism? There are groups that embrace a view called open theism, but what is this open view of God? Open theism, the view that affirms God's, God's omniscience but denies his exhaustive foreknowledge. God's knowledge corresponds to reality, so God knows everything that can be known because the future decisions and actions of his free creatures are not yet reality. God cannot know those matters. Such lack of knowledge is not an imperfection, however, because these matters cannot be known. God still knows everything that can be known. Okay, so... This is, in a nutshell, what they're saying. They, they're saying that God, because we all, this is the open theism, we are reformed in this church. So this is the opposite of Re Reformation theology. Open theism says that man has free will, and so, uh, therefore, God doesn't know exhaustively. He doesn't have exact, precise knowledge of what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow, 
what socks you're going to wear tomorrow. He has a good idea of what you're probably going to wear because he knows the rotation, I suppose. But uh, he's not 100% sure because he doesn't know what free creatures would do. So the advocates of open theism argue that God lives in time. Notice that the attributes of God are usually, con uh, are, are usually compromised uh, when you start engaging in a specific theology. I remember Hank Hanegraaff used to say, virtually every heresy begins with a misconception of the nature of God. Now, from, the reform, from, from basically the historic Christian position, we believe that God lives outside of time. We don't believe that God was younger at some point, and now he's a certain age, and then he's going to get older, uh, that he gets experience. We don't believe that God gains knowledge. He doesn't get seasoned by all of the things that happen. He doesn't learn from us. We believe that God has exhaustive knowledge of all events, past, present, and future. So they argue that God exists in time. This view teaches that if God knows the future, free choices of man, then man cannot be free. If the future is known, then man cannot do other than what God knows. And if man cannot make a different choice than what is foreknown, then man is not free. The only way to maintain the free will of man and maintain that God is omniscient is to limit omniscience to the past and present, but not the future, since it is unknown. This open view embraces that God has a general plan of what he is going to do in human history, but does not have a detailed divine decree. Since the future does not exist, it cannot be known by God, says the open theist. But they do point to Bible verses that seem to teach that God was caught by surprise by human activity. So let's look, I'll look at some of these verses. But, so basically what, they, what they're basically saying is, tomorrow we may make certain choices. Maybe we will decide to mow the lawn tomorrow. Or maybe we'll decide to go to the store and buy a gallon of milk and some eggs. Maybe we'll go to the, maybe someone will decide, hey, why don't we go to the movies tomorrow? You know, they'll take their wife out or their girlfriend out, let's go to the movies. These are decisions that we are making. And they're saying, well, are these free choices? Well, the question is, does God know what choices the people are going to make tomorrow? Well, if God knows them, can a person decide not to do what God knows? If God knows that you're going to go to the movies tomorrow, does that mean that you could just decide, well, you know what, I don't want to go to the movies tomorrow? Well, if you decide not to go, then that means that God didn't know it. But if God did know it and you're supposed to go, you can't not do it, and so they're saying, that, well, therefore, you're not free. True freedom means that you have to be able to decide, I'm not going to go. So God can't know if you're going to go to the movies tomorrow without denying free will. This is the open theist argument. This is the way they think. Now, when we get into the five points of Calvinism, which I'm going to start in the coming weeks, but I need to wrap up the attributes of God. I've got omniscience, then I've got to do omnipotence, and then the sovereignty of God, which will be the last attribute that I cover in this series, will be a... Um, a transition Sunday school in which I'm going to, it will be the end of the attributes of God, but it will be the beginning of the, of the study of Calvinism. So it's going to fit into both series. I, I, I designed it this way. Okay, so let's begin with looking at some of these verses that, that tend to have, shall we say, some shock value and uh, make people get a little unstable, a little shaky about how they understand the nature of God. Uh, let's look, for example, at Genesis 6.6. It says, and Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. He says, uh, Genesis 22, 12, and he said, do not stretch out your hand against the boy and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Before we get to the next verse. So here we have a couple of examples. God created man in Genesis 6. And he saw that man became sinful and this and that. And of course, you have the whole story of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And I'm not going to get into that whole fiasco, the six different interpretations that I'm aware of, uh, you know, regarding what the, 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 um, the Nephilim and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into that. But that, th those events lead up to the flood. So when God says here, or that Je Moses is telling us here, is that God, Yahweh, regretted that he had made man on the earth and he, that he was grieved. That God, that basically the idea is God was like, oh man, I didn't expect this. this thing, things just went south. Man, I, I better clean this up and, 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 and start over, basically is the idea. So in Genesis twenty two twelve, you have God commanding Abraham to uh, basically sacrifice his own son Isaac, his only son, his, his only uh, begotten in terms of the inheritance and all of that. He says, uh, you are supposed to sacrifice your son. 
So he goes up, and just as he's about to kill him, God says, no, don't do it. Now I know that you, uh, what, what does he say? It says uh, that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So here we have God saying, now I know. So the open theist says, see, God didn't know. He tested Abraham, and once Abraham was ready to kill his son, now God knew, because that's what the text says. It says, now I know. Uh, Exodus 32, 14. So Yahweh relented concerning the harm which he said he would do to his people. So here we have an example of God said, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to punish these people. Moses comes to our aid to the people of Israel, set, basically pleads to God, and then God, shall we say, changes his mind. He says, okay, all right, all right, I'll hold off. You know? This is the way the text is being read. Deuteronomy 13.3 You shall not listen to the words Oh, wait a minute. What happened here? Okay. Uh, you shall not listen to the words of the prophet of that of, or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God is trying to find out. So the open theist says, God didn't know. Uh, Jeremiah 23, I'm sorry, 26, 3. Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way that I may relent of the evil which I am de devising to bring up against the people of the evil of their deeds. So here you have God. He's basically trying to find out. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 35. And they, will build the, and they built the high place of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Hinnon to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it come upon my heart that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So the open theist says, God even admits. That never even occurred to him that that would happen. Yes, brother, uh, if you can get that microphone. Please, brother. <clears throat> so you and, and we would agree with John Calvin when he uh, did a commentary on Isaiah 10:15, he says, we must not suppose that there's a violent compulsion as if God dragged them against their will, but in a wonderful, inconceivable manner, he regulates all the movements of man so that they still have the exercise of their will. Yes, absolutely. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That, that is classic reform theology, yes. Uh, so, did you want me to expand on it, or did you have a follow-up? No. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I just mm -hmm. think it really hits it on the head. You know? Yes. Well, because it, from the from the reform perspective, we have uh, what is called compatibilist freedom, uh, in that whenever we do have the ability to make choices, and I'm going to cover this when I get into the the doctrine of total depravity and the five points, uh, but the, and the sovereignty of God specifically. But when we're discussing the issue of man's freedom, exactly how free are we? Because free is just an Free is just, uh, uh, you have the word, uh, you, you have the word will, which describes an aspect of something that we have. We have the ability to make choices. But then when we add the, the, uh, the word free to it, you're now trying to say something about the will. And when we say that man is free, what, what exactly do we mean by that? Uh, is a man, do, do, for example, if we have John Doe standing right here, does that man have the freedom to live free from sin in this life right now? Does anyone say yes? No, okay. So then man's will is not absolutely free. He does not have the freedom to stay away from his sin 100%. That's the struggle of sanctification. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so that's the ongoing struggle. That doesn't really get cleaned up until the resurrection. That's when we're in the perfected state. But there are other aspects of our, our desire. I mean, if you ask me, for example, uh, what would you like to eat today? Would you like to have McDonald's or In-N-Out Burger? There's a lot of people that would prefer In-N-Out Burger. I'm not one of them, and I worked for them for five years. I do like In-N-Out Burger, but it's not my favorite place. I'd rather go to McDonald's or Jack in the Box or Carl's. Okay, so if you ask me, <laughs> so, if you, so if you personally asked me which is my choice, my, I do have freedom to choose any one of those, but which one will my will gravitate towards? It's not going to gravitate towards in and out Burger. I think it's nine out of ten times I won't choose in and out Burger. Are, but I like them. I work for them. We are covering divisions in the church, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but that's what we're talking about, the will, right? Okay, so uh, let's continue. Uh, so uh, 
What was the last one? Jeremiah 32, 35? Yes. Um, Noah, I mean, not Noah, Jonah, to go to Nineveh, mm -hmm. did he know that Nineveh, that he would not, that he wanted, he went to Tarshish, he ran away, he went to Tarshish. Yes. Did he, he know did ahead know. of time everything that was going to happen? Exactly. That's the whole point. I'm going to cover, I'm actually going to mention the Jonah one okay. in a moment, okay. and then I'm going to, I'm going to have a brief discussion of, about that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but yes, the whole point is that God knows everything. That's what the open fee is. Uh, so I'm, as I'm quoting these lists, the Jonah, I'm going to have Ezekiel, and then I have Jonah. So uh, it says, Ezekiel 12, 3, it says, Now as for you, son of man, prepare your, uh, your, for yourself baggage for exile and go into exile by day in their sight, even go into exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will see, though they are a rebellious house. So here God is saying perhaps. You know, he's not sure. At least that's the way it says. Jonah, uh, then God saw their, Jonah 3.10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways, so God relented concerning the evil uh, which he had spoken, he would bring upon them, and he did not bring it upon them. And of course, the, the story goes on to say that Jonah got upset. You know, hey, you said you were going to take him out, and, and you didn't take him out. And uh, and so, and there, are, I've actually had Jehovah's Witnesses use this as a pa of an example of a false prophecy. Not because they I, I, they didn't accuse Jonah of being a false prophet, but they're saying that just because God prophesies something's going to happen doesn't mean it actually has to happen. And and the nature of prophecy is that it's God said it. And so, when you have God saying <clears throat> because you're a rebellious and sinful nation, I am going to judge you. If the, ju if the nation repents, God has the right to say no. It's not a false prophecy because God's the one who said it. Now, if God tells the Ninevites, I'm going to destroy you in 40 days, and the nation, of, uh, the nation of Nineveh doesn't repent, and then God still doesn't punish them, then it's a false prophecy. But it's not a false prophecy. But uh, so he says, these verses seem to teach that God was unsure and at times uh, thought one way and then changed his mind. In essence, God corrected himself and made improvements into his plan because God realized the status quo wasn't working. But the scripture clearly teaches God never changes his plans. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of Yahweh stands forever. The thoughts of his heart from generation to generation. So from generation to generation, the counsel of Yahweh stands. It never changes. Psalm 102.27, but you are the same and your years will not come to an end. So he doesn't grow weary. He doesn't, he's not sus sus uh, subject to the changes that we go through. You know, there are times when we're in our youth, we make certain decisions, we, we take certain actions. And then when we're older, 20, 30 years go by, and we look back and we go, wow, I was young. I shouldn't have done that. I wish I hadn't done that. And you shake your head at yourself. You kind of wish you could go back in time and tell yourself off for some of the choices that you made in the past. Uh, James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from, God, from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So if God were to change his mind about something, there would be variation because he thought one way and his will now varied to something else. So that's why God never changes his mind. So in theology, they make a distinction between the descriptive will of God. This is where God commands us to do something such as, you shall have no other gods before me. That, that's, that's very much, I'm sorry, that's prescriptive, excuse me. That's prescriptive. God is commanding people, you shall not do this, you should do that. That's prescriptive. The other is descriptive. This is where God is basically saying in his decree, these are the things that are going to take place. So an example of that, of course, is in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Now, I don't have that in my notes. But if you read the section, what you have is the, the Jews, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and uh, Jew, Herod and uh, Pontius Pilate, they all basically work together to crucify Jesus of Nazareth. But Luke, the author of the book of Acts, tells us that they were doing what God's plan and God's purpose had predestined them to do. Now, did God put a sword to their throat and say, you must crucify my son? No, he didn't do that. Each one was operating under their own motivations, under their own circumstances to do what they were going to accomplish. But God had decided, if you look in the Gospels, you see Jesus saying, it is not yet my time. God knew exactly when this event was supposed to take place, and it was not supposed to take place prior to the, uh, the, the decreed time. So God actually would restrain the evil of these people 
until the appointed time, and that's when God would lift the hand of restraint, and then that's when they were free to do the things that they were doing. So they were free, but not they were not coerced into doing something that they didn't want to do. It's what they wanted to do. But a lot of times, the things that we want to do, God will prevent us from doing until God actually lifts his hand of restraints and allows us to do it. And so in a way, God's causing it to happen because it is his decree that it's going to happen. This is where we talk about first and secondary causes. Of course, in open theism, these things don't, uh, they don't make, this doesn't make sense to them. For, the, for them, man has to be free. And so in order for man to be free, God can't have exhaustive knowledge of the future. However, we discussed anthropomorphisms and anthropopathism. So when I talked about the omnipresence of God, I talked about anthropomorphisms, and when I discussed uh, the, I, the God, God is impassable, I described anthropopathisms. Okay, so anthropomorphisms, just to remind everybody, a term, found in, uh, a term not found in the Bible derived from Greek anthropos, man, and morphe, form, a figure of speech that describes God as having human form. Uh, and you'll see the verses there. Okay. Uh, uh, so you see, you see uh, verses such as uh, feet, hands, mouth, heart, but in a wider sense, the term also includes human uh, attributes and emotions. This is where we get into anthropopathisms. Anthropopathisms are ascriptions of human passions or feelings to a being or beings not human, especially to a deity. So you, you have passages in the Bible that describe God with human form, whether it be hands, eyes, feet, nose, because God, what we discussed already is that God it does not have a physical body. He is not human and he doesn't have body parts in his passages. So we have symbolic or poetic passages that describe him with human forms and human uh, attributes. But then you have anthropopathisms where you have God described with having human passions. Now, this does not mean, because we believe in impassibility, which we covered in a previous Sunday school, this does not mean that God doesn't have emotions. It means that his emotions are not something that controls him. It's like with us, if we get angry, sometimes it's not a good, the wisest moment to approach us because we need to cool off. With God, there is no such thing as there's not the right time to talk to him because he needs to cool off. God is always cool, calm and collective, and yet at the same time he is angry at sin while also being loving and merciful and all of these things. That's why the attributes of God are so important. Yes, sister. That would be kind of like the Greek gods, how they portrayed God. Oh, don't stop these right now because he's mad or he's, you know, upset. It's exactly. Kind of difference between. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're, you grew up, you're part of my generation. So uh, you probably watched Hercules and the Legendary sure, Journeys. Yeah. Zena, you watched Xena, Warrior that. Princess. Okay. So <laughs> when you're looking at the Greek gods, you find you have, the, in fact, in the introduction to the Hercules show, they would say when the gods were petty and cruel. And so they have these descriptions about how these gods can be jealous. They can be selfish. They can be envious they, they can go to war with each other because they, they they feel that one is trying to usurp maybe their territory or something like that in fact that was part of the reason why there's supposed to be the trojan war with with in the iliad and and all of that so w when you're looking at these things you describe you're basically looking at these gods of the pagan world but they're described just like humans are and because they're, they basically have very human characteristics. Whereas in the biblical God, the God is holy. He is different from us. And the whole purpose of the redemption of, of ourselves is that God is making us more like him. Whereas the world tries to make God more like us, God is trying to make us more like him. So you see the reversal. Even in sin, you see that the world is trying to make God more like us, whereas God is trying to make us more like him. Not, not that we're going to become almighty and all, all that stuff, but, but you get what I'm saying. So let's look at some of these verses. But we are told in Scripture that God contrasts himself from the pagan gods by pointing to his foreknowledge of the future. Isaiah 41, 21 through 24. Bring near to your cause. Yahweh says, bring forward your mighty arguments. The, the king of Jacob says, let them bring it forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may establish our heart on them and know their, their outcome, or cause us to be hear of what is coming. Declare the things that are to come afterwards, that we may know that you are gods. Indeed, do good or evil, that we may we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you are nothing and your work is non-existent. He who chooses you is an abomination. So God is challenging them through the prophet. He's challenging them to say, tell me what's going to happen in the future. 
because that's definitional of the God of the Bible, Yahweh, the fact that he knows the future. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my counsel will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Okay, and then Isaiah 48, 3 through 5. I declare the former things long ago and they went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to be heard. Suddenly I acted, and they came to pass, because I know that you are stiff, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead bronze. Therefore I declare them to you long ago, before they happened, I caused them to be heard by you. Let you say, my idol has done them, and my graven image and my molten image have commanded them. So th this is part of the problem. You see, from the reform perspective, now this is where we differ from the non-reformed perspectives, whether it be Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, whether it be Evangelical, Arminian, whatever the spectrum that you hold, you, you have people like uh, Molinists, and Molinists uh, believe that God has what is called middle knowledge. And so what they're saying is that God, through his middle knowledge, this mechanism that he uses to make choices or to actuate whatever reality or whatever universe is supposed to take place, this maintains the freedom of man and the sovereignty of God, says the Molinist. Now, I'm not saying that that's a heretical view. I'm just saying that the view, I don't find it to be biblical. And in fact, uh, when I did a, a, the Christian Thought in the World with Brother James and Brother Eric, we actually showed a clip of William Lane Craig admitting that the Bible doesn't teach Molinism. It's just a system that, they, that he finds that fits the biblical narrative, even though the biblical narrative, if you remember that, he said that it was not taught by the, the biblical writers. So, yes, Brother. Um, real quick, one thing that has concerned me about a theologian such as William Lane Craig, I've, I've seen him debate live, I think he's... A, a good creator, yeah. and he's he has merits. However, I've noticed that as uh, his Molinist view has become more front and center, I see other areas slipping, such as well, did Jesus really have to be part of a virgin? Mm -hmm. And such questions that every time I see a clip of him, I'm like, oh, geez, I don't even want to click on it because mm -hmm. in my self-righteous self, then I, I start hating on him, so to speak. Right. Uh, can you comment anything about the actual the actual implementation of Molinism in our, in our thought and our theology may affect other areas? Right. I, I don't think that his Molinism is what's pulling him in that direction necessarily. Uh, I, I think that, I, I guess, uh, now I don't know Dr. Craig and... Um, I've never met him, and uh, I've never actually heard him speak in public, but I, I have watched videos of him and listened to him debate, and he's brilliant. His IQ is probably off the charts. Uh, the, the problem that I see, and I remember, uh, uh, I know that Dr. James White has talked about this, and the late Dr. Robert Moore used to mention this, and, and the, the problem is that from the Christian worldview, what we're supposed to do is, here's the Bible. This is the Word of God, okay? So when we look at the Bible, we're supposed to have this frame our worldview. This is supposed to tell us how to think. So when we look at philosophy, we should look at it through the glasses, if we can use this as a, gla as, as a metaphor for glasses, through which we interpret the philosophy, whether how we understand. Yes, and so, 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 uh, when, so this is the same thing for like economics and politics. The Bible should be our main focus. But... When it, when it comes to William Lane Craig, he believes his philosophy has to come before his Bible reading. And I'm not going to ascribe that to all Molinists. But what, what, what happens with him is that he is more philosophically minded. And so he doesn't mind saying that the Bible doesn't teach, but I still believe. Uh, and so uh, I think he, the problem, that, the defect that I would see, the deficiency I think in his theology is the fact that he doesn't see the Bible uh, or at least he doesn't seem to indicate that the Bible should be the foundation for all knowledge. Rather, he feels that the Bible should be built upon another knowledge. And, and this gets into, his, because like natural theology, there are a lot of Reformed people who don't believe in natural theology at all, uh, such as the late Dr. Mori. And then you have guys that do believe in, uh, in natural theology, but they have a very small view of it, such as Reformed Calvinists. And then you have, the, the, the further away you get from Calvinism, in a lot of ways, the larger natural theology becomes, the more especially that you are into philosophy. So I think that the deficiency in him is that 
He thinks that you need to read the Bible through a, a pre-existing framework rather than creating the fam framework on the Bible. Yeah, the other one I saw recently is, is uh, Genesis 1, really historical, mm -hmm. right? And then again, yeah. he gets an answer and like, <laughs> I mean, the, the problem has to do with, the, that has to do with the creation issue, and there, there, I don't believe in theistic evolution, but there are some people, like Dinesh D'Souza is a the, theistic yeah, evolutionist. Yeah, so he, these are people that believe that the, the text, uh, that there are pre-existing Adamic races, and they, they do try to harmonize. They do believe there was an Adam, they, or at least I heard, a, a, I can't remember the guy, he has his own uh, YouTube channel called Inspiring Philosophy. He's a brilliant guy, but he's a theistic evolutionist. So, uh, uh, I'm really much, yeah, so I'm really much uh, in a situation where uh, uh, it's a hard question to deal with those kind of people, but I think it's a discussion that needs to be getting. We need to get back to the Bible. So I would like to end with this. Historically, the church has always taught that God has exhaustive knowledge of past, present, and future. It is his decree of all human history that is the basis of his divine foreknowledge. This is why God can prophesy about the future. We take comfort in what God promises to us because they are all part of his divine plan. And this is from the late the church father Augustine. Whatever is past no longer exists and whatever is future does not exi yet exist. But the past and the future therefore are entirely absent. To God, however, nothing is absent and hence nothing is either past or future, but everything is present to God. Let's pray. Father God, I would like to thank you for allowing us to get to know you more because uh, as, as it is told in, your, in the high priestly prayer of your son, uh, here then is eternal life to know the only true God. And it is through knowing you to having a deeper understanding of who you are and what you mean to us and how we live our lives that we are able to grow and serve you in the, in the, in the, and be strengthened even when we get through these difficult times when, uh, people, when we lose the people that we love. And we ask you to, to help all of those people and we ask you to help us grow in our sanctification so that we may grow stronger to bear these things and be more appreciative when you actually grant us our prayers. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.